uh, this was a farmer rancher grant. It ran from approximately 2012 through 2015, um, through part of 2015. And I do work for the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture and also until lately worked for Greenland's Blue Waters as well, which is a um, related program. And I'd like to acknowledge a few people. Uh, my cooperators are the first three people on the list. There were four of us farmers in this project. Um, we all had fairly different types of grass-fed operations, so that was um, interesting to see in the project. Troy Salzer, Carleton County Extension, he presented before lunch on his cover crops project. Uh, Wayne Martin, University of Minnesota Extension Alternative Livestock Program. Uh, my husband and my families who had to help me with dragging around livestock scale and uh, messing around with animals a lot more than we normally do for working the cattle to get those weights. Uh, Kate Clancy, um, she had an endowed chair position with the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture in grass-fed beef a number of years ago and uh, the information that she generated was helpful. Uh, my boss, Helene Murray, who said, Yep, great, do this project, we like it. Uh, Chris Johnson, who was on the MESA Board of Directors and sent me the paper that kicked this whole thing off. Our Minnesota SARE co-coordinators, Kate, uh, Kate Seeger and Betsy Weiland. Um, the Midwest Perennial Forage Working Group, which is under Greenland's Blue Waters, and I uh, had a lot of feedback from those people and conversation with them. Rich Pirog, who was a co-author on the paper that caused me to do this project. And Laura Payne, who I should have changed this because she's now with the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship, no longer with Southwest Badger. Okay. So to set this up, um, many of you, since you're from Iowa, I'm sure know about the Leopold Center and the research that's done there. And uh, Rick Cruz, the head of the Iowa Water Center, has been working with um, Leopold funding to look at soil erosion, and um, he has been finding some really interesting and alarming things. Uh, one of which is that the T value that's used for allowable soil erosion by the NRCS is 5.5 tons per acre per year of soil loss, but what Rick says is that severely underestimates the actual amount of soil erosion because it does not take into account ephemeral gullies that happen in spring rains, fall rains, when the soil is mostly bare. And that creates actually a lot of soil loss. And Rick also says that the actual rate of soil formation is not 5.5 tons per acre per year, but more like 0 0.5 tons per acre per year. So there's a tremendous a lot of soil erosion happening. Um, and then, if you look at the type of cropping system, that uh, you have, that makes a huge impact on the percentage uh, or on the amount of soil loss. And if you look at um, what kind of cropping system can reduce soil loss, corn soybean is kind of the baseline. You've got a, a pretty severe soil loss with that. And then you can reduce it by going to these other things. And permanent pasture reduces that soil loss by more than 90%. So that's why People are interested in grass-fed beef and in grazing as a way to protect soil. Uh, okay, this is a great picture from the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas. Uh, Wes Jackson, if some of you know him, is um, just retiring as the director of that, but he's, he's a pretty tall guy, and they've got these washed perennial grass roots hanging up on a clothesline. Um, and they're, they're really long, right? I mean, that's a very extensive root system. And when you have a whole pasture of all those grasses growing together and cross-linking the roots and sending those roots down really deep, uh, you are, you're practically eliminating soil erosion from that field. So perennial grasses are a soil erosion fighter. And grass-fed beef, of course, is a way you can utilize perennial pasture and make it profitable. So, so I bought into that. I'm a grass-fed beef producer um, for environmental reasons. And uh, then this paper came out in 2010 
Comparative life cycle environmental impacts of three beef production strategies in the upper Midwestern United States. And uh, <clears throat> Chris Johnson on the MISA board circulated that paper and I read it and found this conclusion. Impacts per live weight kilogram of beef produced were highest for pasture finished beef for all impact categories and lowest for feedlot finished beef. They're talking about environmental impacts here and saying that feedlot beef has a lower environmental impact, lower eco, smaller ecological footprint than pasture finished beef. And I thought, how can this possibly be? So picking through that paper some more, I started to figure out uh, why that could be. Um, in their materials and methods, they use this standard figure. Calves weaned to pasture in Iowa finish at 505 kilograms, that's about 1,111 pounds, in 450 days on a ration of forage and hay. That's a long time to spend finishing a cow or a steer. Um, yeah, so these are the figures used by that Pelletier paper. Uh, the grass-fed beef finish time, 450 days, a year plus three months. So uh, that's the time post-weaning, okay? So that's like 15 months plus seven months at weaning age, they assumed. Uh, I know grass-fed beef often goes longer, but they were assuming seven months in that paper. So you're looking at 22 months compared to feedlot beef finish time post-weaning, of 10 months and getting a much larger animal out of the deal. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's where this paper was winding up with some really um, negative, negative impacts from grass-fed beef because these animals were taking so long to finish and um, that was feeding into the analysis in this paper of you know impact acreage, the amount of acreage that was needed to carry that animal for that long. Uh, so where did these figures come from? Well, one of the co-authors on that paper was Rich Pirog, and he uh, used to be here at Iowa State University Extension. He's now in Michigan. But um, I was, you know, I knew who he was through my MISA work, and so I got a hold of him and said, where did you get these figures? Why are you using such a long uh, finishing time for grass-fed beef? Because from my own experience, I knew I could finish an animal on grass quicker than that. Maybe not a lot heavier, but certainly quicker. Um, so he said, well, we didn't have um, published data. And so we went with some estimates put together by beef researchers in Iowa um, from grass-fed production that they had seen, and that's what they told us. And I'm like, well, this is a published research journal and you're using somebody's guess. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so a couple things I knew about grass-fed production is that uh, a lot of grass-fed beef production is done with heritage beef breeds, and a lot of it is done on pastures that are kind of indifferently managed. And so, um, so I knew, or I was pretty sure, that those numbers were confounded by the beef breed and by the level of management. And so... What the paper was doing was taking like modern Angus or modern Hereford beef genetics in the feedlot system and comparing that to kind of an average grass-fed number that included heritage beef breeds and some sketchily managed pasture. And it wasn't a fair comparison. So I wanted to know, okay, what would happen if you took a modern beef breed that has been bred for production and um, put it in a very well-managed pasture grazing situation to produce grass-fed beef, would you still get that poor of a performance from the grass-fed beef? And that question is where this project starts. 
uh, Rich Pirog said, yep, that could have made a real difference because um, you know, the length of time to finish was something that really, really made the grass-fed beef look bad in that research that they did. And then he said to me, if you get a chance to collect the data, do it, because we didn't have published data. And so that kind of dropped the responsibility right back on my shoulders. And I said, OK, we'll try to collect this data. So um, these are the collaborators. All of, all of these people are in Minnesota. They're all kind of in the eastern third of Minnesota. Uh, Edgar Brown is up in the Duluth area. Jake and Lindsey Grass are in Pine City, which is north of the Twin Cities. I'm in Palisade, Minnesota, which is kind of northeast central, um, a ways west of Duluth. And Bill McMillan is from down by Rochester. And we were using some different breeds, but I tried to find people who were using modern breeds. And um, as you can see, the grasses have Scottish Highlander, which is a heritage breed, but they were, um, they were managing them as a separate group from their more modern genetics, which also included some British White and Ayrshire. So not strictly modern, but um, they did have the Black Angus in there. And that was kind of serendipitous. I had wanted to use British breeds only, but it turned out to be a really good thing that Jake Grass had those Scottish Highlanders. And you'll see why in a bit. OK, we, um, we had some really different types of forage that we fed our animals, especially in the winter. Um, we did hay testing. and. So some of these RFEs are pretty low, and then McMillan's is really high. Um, Bill McMillan is a former dairy farmer, and he was using his dairy infrastructure around Rochester, Minnesota, to produce some pretty good uh, alfalfa hay and alfalfa haylage, and doing bunk feeding. And so he was really in a you know a high production type of situation. Um, Edgar Brown has a farm in an area that's got, pretty he's poor. using some run out pastures. Um, he's doing his own haying all by himself. He's like almost 80. Uh, so he had some pretty poor quality hay that he was feeding. He was letting his animals sort it. So the animals were getting <coughs> a little better than that RFP might indicate. Grass Meadows Farm, we're running a bunch of um, animals on rental property and renting uh, hay ground and using several different types. They were trying to keep three different types of feed in front of their animals at all times so that the animals could kind of sort. And then I was using round bales um, that my brother hayed and I bought from him and it's you know, it's not the most wonderful relative feed value on there either. But all of us were kind of locked into our systems for various reasons. And so this is what we had. So here's where we start to see the bottom line. We, um, we took weights on these animals in 2012 on the 2011 calf crop. And we took weights in 2013 on the 2012 calf crop. And in between, we, did, um, we didn't do birth weights because a lot of us weren't set up to do that. We're calving out on pasture. It, it wouldn't work. But we did um, birth dates so that we knew exactly how old the calves were at slaughter then because we could go back to their birth date. And we took weaning weights, and we took pre-pasture weights before they were turned out the second summer after they were born, and then final slaughter and live weights. Um, live weight and carcass weight. And so these show the carcass weights, age of animal versus carcass weights, and compares the weights that we found on these animals with the um, figures that came out of that life cycle analysis paper, which were kind of a standard feedlot and a standard grass-fed figure. Uh, so the standard feedlot and grass-fed figures from that paper are shown by the vertical lines. And, um, and then the weights from those paper, from that paper are shown by the circles on those vertical lines. And then all the data that we collected from our farms um, are, the, are the scattered dots and triangles and squares and X's. 
So here's the cluster of the Grass Meadows um, Scottish Highlander cattle. And it overlaps the um, standard grass-fed carcass performance from the paper. Um, but most of these were either lighter or took longer to finish. And so that's why it was serendipity that Jake Grass had those Highlander cattle because we could, you know, we could map those out and show that yes, the heritage breed definitely was dragging down the average of grass fed. And here's their Angus Galbvay herd, which also um, overlapped and was really the closest to the average of that grass fed average from the paper. Um, okay, and here's Edgar Brown's herd, which was a little bit more spread out for finishing ages. Um, he had run into some breeding problems. He, he was kind of disappointed with the performance of his cattle, but it did overlap that grass-fed average, and some of them performed better. Okay, so those are those three clusters of forms, farms that overlapped that um, grass-fed average from the life cycle analysis paper. And then here's Bill McMillan. And all of his animals finished sooner and at a higher carcass weight than the average grass-fed. Um, you can see that there's that little circle of the average grass-fed, and then all of his animals are up and to the left of it. And his slaughter ages were right in line with the feedlot average. And then there's mine. Um, actually, this project was a really humbling experience for me. Uh, but Bill is clearly doing better in terms of carcass weights, and I was, I was getting my finishing times right in line with feedlot, but the weights weren't up there. Okay, so there are all those clusters of the different groups of animals that we looked at. And um, that's a lot of stuff to look at, and if you're feeling like you're just not getting it, that's fine, because I felt the same way when I looked at this and went, you know, okay, we gotta make this um, a little bit clearer. So here's, so I came up with an age weight index, and these are the age weight indexes of the feedlot beef and the grass-fed beef in that life cycle analysis study. The average age at slaughter, 16.9 months, carcass weight estimate, 840 pounds for feedlot beef, and um, then you just divide those, divide the weight by the age at slaughter, and come up with an age weight index of 49.7. And then the grass-fed beef, same thing, divide the carcass weight at slaughter by the age at slaughter and come up with that index of 26.5. And then I did that for all of the animals in the study, which we could do because we knew their exact ages, uh, because we had their birth weights, their birth dates, and we had their slaughter dates. And um, so I could calculate their exact ages to the day. And uh, then plotted that. And, okay, this is starting to um, be a little more clear. So these are the age weight indexes, and the horizontal lines now are the ones from the life cycle analysis paper. We've got the feedlot almost up at 50. We've got the grass fed at 26.5, and then you can see how all the animals in the study stacked up to it. And that circled point up there is one of Bill McMillan's steers that finished out at like 749 pounds in 14 months from birth, okay? So that one exceeded the age weight index for feedlot. Um, okay, and you can see that there are quite a few of the animals that exceeded it for grass fed. Okay, so, and here's just another way to show the same data. We've got the, uh, on the right-hand side of the chart, there's the um, life cycle analysis feedlot age weight index and the grass-fed age weight index. And that horizontal line is the um, grass-fed level from the paper. And then you can see that McMillan's um, on average was, on average was lower than the feedlot, but quite a bit higher than the grass-fed, kind of midway between it. Um, mine was a little bit higher than grass-fed, that's because of the earlier age, but as I mentioned, the weights weren't great. And 
Um, and then browns and grass meadows were either on the line or below it. So what do we know now? Um, so now we know that livestock breed matters a lot when you're comparing grass-fed systems to feedlot systems. And if you're um, looking at doing that kind of comparison, you really need to pay attention to what breeds of livestock are in each one. And if you're comparing you know, heritage breed grass-fed to modern breed um, feedlot, yeah, you're going to see worse performance from the grass-fed, but it's not necessarily because grass-fed is bad. Um, a grass-fed system has the potential to approach the feedlot system in productivity if you're looking at that index of carcass weight produced in a given time frame. So, um, you know, not all of the animals made it there, but Bill McMillan had one that exceeded it and a bunch that were close. And so what that tells me is that there is room for improvement of grass-fed beef production systems because there was this whole... Um, this whole spread of performance and you know and some of the animals were performing very very well and so there's room within each farm for improvement to get up to the top level of on that farm and there's room between farms for improvement and I think that's something that's really important to keep hammering because um, what I've heard from some beef researchers is that Grass-fed, it takes you 24 months to get an 1,100-pound animal. That's it. That's all you'll ever get, you know. And it seems really defeatist to me. But you look at this data and you can see there's no reason to be defeatist about that. There is improvement to be made, and if we pay attention and work on it, we can get better. Um, okay, I'm going to quickly go through some average daily gains. Uh, so these are average daily gains of the Macmillan farm, and this is 2013, 2012 born calves only. So data from 2012 and 2013. Um, and so it's not a real big sample size, it's just one year. And as you'll see, um, the weather on some of the farms impacted this in 2012. So. So Bill McMillan's got 272 days from birth to weaning and 91 days from weaning to pasture and 153 days from pasture to finish. And uh, that's, you know, he's, he's doing a good job. Grass meadows, um, the average daily gains, you know, pretty decent, but he's got a really long time in there of the pasture to finish time frame. He's got 370 days on that. Uh, and here's his Scottish Highlander calves. And again, the pasture to finish, um, he's got 446 days on that. They were taking a really long time to finish, and their average daily gains were not so high. Oh, and here's mine. Uh, this was painful. So um, this was, again, 2012 born calves. And we had the pasture to finish, average daily gains, darn near nothing. Um, so what happened here is that I actually had some loss of weight in the uh, days from pasture turnout to slaughter in the first days after they went out on pasture. And um, this is for, okay, this shows 2012 and 2011 born steers. Um, what was happening here is we had some really tough weather. In 2012 especially, we were, we were in flood conditions, the same flood that hit the city of Duluth, Minnesota. And, uh, you know, I, I could watch it. I could watch the weight melting off my cattle that summer. We had six weeks of wet feet and um, then three weeks of extreme heat and humidity. And I had foot rot. It was dreadful. So. So that did affect uh, what the animals were able to do. And it also looks like there's an adjustment period for going from the winter hay to the spring pasture. Again, we had that tremendous amount of moisture. We had tremendous growth of washy pasture and um, perhaps not the best quality winter forage. And so, uh, yeah, that's not a good situation. 
Okay, so again, looking at the relative feed values here, um, one thing I personally learned is that, you know, taking those bale rings away and letting the animals sort the hay if you've got some not so um, high quality forage is actually a pretty good thing to do. And so I've done that now. I'm not in a position to get my relative feed value up because I'm not gonna feed grain, I'm grass fed and my customers appreciate that. And um, I'm, I'm buying feed from my brother, I'm buying hay that's produced within a close area of my farm and I'm not going to change that. But what I can change is letting the cattle sort the hay. And um, actually I'm seeing better body condition scores this winter from letting them do that. Um, okay, and this is the McMillan farm and you're not seeing any similar pattern of negative average daily gain when they go out on pasture. But Bill's got that, again, really high quality winter feed. He's keeping the cattle on high quality stuff all the time up until they go out on pasture. And it just seems like maybe um, he's not seeing that drop because of there not being such a disparity in quality. Uh, comparative economics of the four farms. Okay, in the report, I've got a lot more detail on this and how this was all calculated. Um, I did not pick through each farmer's financial records. I didn't want to um, have that level of knowledge of their personal finances. And, um, and also, a lot of us have particular things that we do, like Bill McMillan is um, doing some sale of hay and buying back other hay. And, and Edgar Brown has um, deals where he's getting really, really inexpensive access to hay ground. And I'm getting a price break on the hay that I buy. So, so I standardized all of this based on the prices at the Sox Center Minnesota hay auction in November of 2014. So this does not reflect the actual finances of each farm, but it's a standardized picture of how we stack up if you're looking at what we're feeding, how much we're feeding the steers, um, what kind of carcass weights we're getting, and then the pricing is also standardized based on the USDA's grass-fed beef marketing report. So it also doesn't reflect the actual prices that the farmers are getting, but it's a standardized figure. Uh, so looking at that, um, the dollars per steer net, actually, Edgar Brown came out the winner with an extremely low cost system where he's feeding poor quality hay. I mean, it was relative feed value of 90. He's letting the cows sort it, so he's feeding a lot of it, um, working on very cheap kind of run down hay ground with old equipment and doing all the work himself and um, managing his pastures very, very carefully to get the maximum grazing that he can out of those pastures and keeping animals as long as he needs to to get them up to the weight that he wants to have them at for his sale. Um, and he's getting $124 per acre net, which I can tell you in his part of Carleton County, Minnesota is pretty darn good. Um, okay, and then Grass Meadows Farm actually was the lowest dollars per steer of net, so I was happy I was not the lowest on one single category here. Um, and Bill McMillan, you know, he's a higher cost uh, operator, and he's told me that a number of times. I'm a high cost operator, but he was also getting phenomenal steer weights and grossing high dollars per steer, and you know, his dollar per steer net was pretty decent and um, his productivity per acre was the highest. And that um, $332 per acre net is pretty competitive with uh, corn and bean cropping in his area down by Rochester, Minnesota, and more competitive now than it was a couple years ago. Um, okay, so like I said, I've got this long detailed report that goes through all the um, calculations that I did to figure this stuff out. And if you want to find it, it's on the SARE website and you go to www.sare.org um, and then go to project reports. And then from there, search the database and search it with that title 
and, and or my name and it'll pop up and you can get the reports and a copy of this PowerPoint um, and a four page little summary of the key points from that, from that study. Yeah, the question is about, um, about carcass yield and then retail cut yield from the carcasses for grass-fed beef. And uh, on the carcass yield, I used a 52% yield figure, which is lower than you would see for feedlot beef. Um, we did the calculations on the animals in this study, and Bill McMillan's were, he had a few that were up over 55%, but but most of them in the study were more in that um, 50 to 54% range. And so we used 52%. Uh, and then the question was, okay, what about going from the carcass weight down to retail cuts? Um, none of us in the study at this, at this time were marketing retail cuts. So Edgar was selling to Thousand Hills Cattle Company. Um, I was selling primarily to individual customers as quarters and halves. Uh, Bill McMillan and Jake Grass were both, let's see, Jake was selling to Thousand Hills and Bill was selling to another um, local distributor down in southeastern Minnesota. And so we don't know. We don't know the retail cutout on that. We just know the, the carcass. Okay, question? In your... Uh the net per acre, in the, in, in the net dollars per acre figure, is there a land charge in there in the feed, in the feed per steer, is there a land charge figure, or is the, the dollars per acre net basically a return to land use? Um, no, there was a, a land charge. I put in um, cash rents, which was a little bit difficult because you know there's good data on that for southern Minnesota, Rochester area. Um, as you go north in northeastern Minnesota, it gets a little iffier. And like in Aiken County where I am, and Carleton County where Edgar is, there just there were barely figures for cash rent because corn and soybeans are not are not a thing. Um, so we pulled together some estimates, and then for um, grazing land, because you know some of us had crop land that was tillable, even if low value, and, uh, and then pasture land that is what the um, National Agriculture Statistics Service calls pasture land, which is not tillable. It's grazable, but not really tillable. Um, for that figure down in the Rochester area, we um, came up with an estimate of $35 per acre for a pasture rent. And for northern Minnesota, yeah, it's, it would be essentially zero. Um, we put a small dollar amount on it just to have something there. But that pasture land, if you're willing to throw a fence around it, you can often get it for nothing. So yeah, those figures are in there. How many Okay, question about elimination of the round bale feeders and how many am I feeding and how many head. Um, I have a pretty small herd. I've got 12 cows that I'll be calving this spring. And uh, I'm, I'm feeding bales that are like about 1,600 pounds, 15 to 1,600 pound round bales. So I'm allowing myself eight bales per cow. and. This is northeastern Minnesota. We get quite a bit of below zero weather. So, uh, you know, I have to allow for more hay than you might think of down here in Iowa. Um, so I'm out wintering. I've got the bales set up in a grid pattern out in my field, and I'm allowing the cows, you know, probably three bales at a time so that all of them can get at the hay and have enough to not be bored and go looking for trouble. Um, and, you know, it's, it's working for me. You do have more of what you would call waste, but I don't call it waste because it's going back onto the pasture and breaking down and being um, organic matter that's applied to the soil. And I am not paying full market price for my hay. I'm getting it from my brother. I arrange for the hauling of it off the field. He doesn't have to deal with any shipping costs. So, you know, it's a, it's a cheaper, 
hay price and it kind of washes out with having to have more hay for the cows and letting them sort through it and not eat all of it. Yeah, a question about whether we um, evaluated the, the grade of finish on the carcass, and no, we didn't. We just looked at um, weights because that's all that was in that life cycle paper that irritated me. So, uh, <laughs> and, you know, and a number of us were um, direct marketing. I mean, I was doing 100% direct marketing. Uh, Bill and Jake and Edgar were all doing some direct marketing. It wasn't so much of a concern for us with those. And um, the ones that were sold to Thousand Hills or Hidden Stream, the other Southeast Minnesota distributor, uh, you know, I, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but they were grading well. I'm sure you're right. Question about the average daily gain for finishing on pasture. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot more improvement to be done. I mean, this particular group of farmers wasn't hitting that. And, and yet even so, Bill with particular animals was able to approach feedlot efficiency. So, you know, and these are, these are kind of northern Minnesota, eastern Minnesota, cool season grasses. Um, I think you might be able to see higher gains with some of the, like grazing on big blue stem with higher protein in the fall type of thing. Um, other places where there's a longer grazing season and you can get higher productivity of, of high bricks grasses throughout the season, which we weren't able to do. So yeah, I mean, there's plenty of room for, you know, even getting more grass-fed animals above that feedlot efficiency line. Thanks so much. Thanks, Brady. What, were, what was your pastures? What were you using for just a cool season mix? Or? Um, what were my pastures like? They were... Um, quack grass and timothy and red clover and some bird's foot tree foil primarily. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, question about whether I'd considered warm season grasses in my mix. No, um, because where I'm at in northeastern Minnesota, we rarely have a warm season. <laughs> you know, um, that may change with climate change. We'll see. But uh, yeah, up there, we don't really see a summer slump. Um, we don't get the, the sustained hot temperatures in July and August. Um, we've had frost every single month of the year up there. Um, July 1st, one year, August 23rd, you know. So we don't really, I think the benefit of warm season grasses for areas where you consistently see that summer slump and that late summer, early fall drought, it would be great. We don't consistently see that. And so, um, so the cool season grasses are, are what we rely on up there.